to be put in that situation and then actually have the opportunity to be the person to make the shot, it just kind of makes you think were you rehearsing at that time when you were young or were you preparing? And so I've always liked to think that I was just being prepared for the moment and when I got the opportunity to actually live it, you know, for, for me, I lived it out. It was 30 years ago, a shot was made. The shot that sealed Arkansas basketball's national championship. Back to Stewart, right side Thurman. He's open for three, good! And the man behind it, Scotty Thurman. Thurman and he's got another three. Scotty Thurman with 20 points. Thurman was a prolific high school and college player. A 40 plus percent three point shooter. Oh, this is a game of horse. <laughs> a thousand point scorer freshman All-American, and of course, a national champion. Arkansas wins a national championship by Arkansas After two consecutive trips to the championship game and a 500 plus point season, to the surprise of many Arkansas fans, Thurman declared for the NBA draft. But what made him leave Arkansas a year early? The one thing that I learned from my grandmother and my grandfather, who was a pastor, they said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. I stopped making plans a long time ago. I just tried to make preparation. And why did he never play a game in the NBA? That was tough for me to deal with, to be honest. You know, I struggled with, you know, a lot of things at that time. What made him hang up his professional career in Europe and settle down in Arkansas? I want you to go to the tonight, man. Oh, you better believe it. I'm going to call him right up here. <laughs> Doesn't matter if Coach Musselman was the coach or Nolan Richards was the coach or Mike Anderson. At the end of the day, I'm still a Razorback. Hog fans are familiar with the man who made the shot. But in this episode, we find out more about the man and about his life since the shot. He's open for three. Good! 30 years later, we sit down with the legend himself to answer just that. It's been 30 years since you uh, made the shot, heard round Arkansas and beyond to win the national championship. Are you, are you tired of talking about it yet? I'm not tired of talking about it. You know, I, I realize that it's, you know, it's definitely a uh, big deal in terms of the historic, uh, historical st- you know, part of it. I also understand that, you know, a lot of fans in, in light of kind of what's transpired this season are looking for something positive to kind of lean on. Uh, and so I get it. Uh, I also realize there are a lot of worse things, you know, that people could be approaching me to talk about. And so I just kind of take it all in stride and just try to enjoy the moment. This has been kind of a crazy two weeks for me because every time I talk to someone, they're like 30 years ago, 30 years ago, what happened? And so it's kind of brought back a lot of memories, uh, but you know, this is always a great time. When you think about March Madness, it's kind of hard not to reminisce about those times. You had such a great career, and there's so many other things we could talk about and how many threes you made. But not everybody gets to make a game-winning shot. Right. It, it, maybe even once. I mean, eventually you're probably going to hit one if you play long enough and you're as good as you were and score like you do. But, I mean, this is the stuff you dream about in, you know, sports from a young age, right? Trying to just outside playing by yourself. And you got to not only live that, it, it's there forever. Right. It's never going away. Right. What's that? Walk me through just, just kind of carrying that around a little bit. Well, you know, it's kind of funny, man. I was having this conversation with one of my uh, former teammates in Europe. You know, when I played in Europe, we were just talking about, you know, the good old days. He played at Louisville. I played at Arkansas. We both had, you know, fairly good careers. And so we just kind of reminisce about, you know, games and places that we played. And so we were just talking about what you just mentioned, which is having the opportunity to make that shot. And I was like, just imagine, you know, growing up in Ruston, Louisiana. He grew up in South Carolina. So we were kind of comparing our roots. and. You know, I was just like, imagine being an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old, and you're constantly going outside shooting baskets. Almost every shot that you take, it's like, it's a buzzer beater in your mind. You know, it's three, two, one. And so having the opportunity to watch so many guys play at the collegiate level, because for me, you know, CBS Sports and, you know, Big East Basketball, Raycom, Jefferson Pilot, I mean, that was pretty much the way that my evenings were spent you know, ESPN, and so I've had an opportunity to emulate so many different people, whether it was Carl Malone, who was kind of a childhood hero of mine playing there at La Tech, and then, you know, watching Keith Smart, who I grew up watching play in South Louisiana, make one in Indiana, uh, Dallas Comagees, those guys were on TBS all the time, and, 
you know, WGN, so I got a chance to see him with DePaul. And so I've had an opportunity to emulate so many different people and to be put in that situation and then to actually have the opportunity to be the person to make the shot, it just kind of makes you think where you were rehearsing at that time when you were young or were you preparing. And so I've always liked to think that I was just being prepared for the moment. And when I got the opportunity to actually live it, you know, for, for me, I lived it out. You get to see it all the time. People talk to you about it all the time. I mean, do you ever find yourself just thinking about it, like driving down the road or? No, I, I really don't think about it much myself. I mean, someone would have to approach me to have that conversation. But I mean, you know, during this time of the year, you know, once it hits March, I, I get asked probably more than any other time uh, during the year, whether I'm in the gym working out, whether I'm in a restaurant with my family eating, going to church on Sunday, someone is always going to bring it up. And so... A long time ago, my daughter, before she was her age now, when she was small, you know, people would come up and say, you know, I remember where I was when you made that shot. You know, I remember where you were when, you know, you guys won the championship. And so she used to always say, Dad, you know, that's that's annoying. And that, you know, but she was young. She didn't really understand. And so I was like, listen, there could be a lot worse things that people could be coming up to me to talk about. And then the other part of that equation is I could have missed a shot and they could have not ever wanted to talk to me. And so... You know, I just kind of take it all in stride. It's not something that I would say overwhelms me, uh, but during this time of year, I do often reflect back. And you were a career 40 plus percent three point shooter. You made 85 threes that season, uh, 36 minutes in that national championship game, 15 points, done bigger than those three, had five rebounds in the game. Um, but you, you sealed Arkansas's national championship. And we're going to move on from that. We're going to talk about, you know, life since the shot. But but walk me back to the next year, you know, like we're being on campus and and you're already a legend for hitting that shot, but you still got to show up and play every day and, right. and, and not just be in that moment. What what was it like, though, being that guy? Well, coming back, you know, originally it was a lot of fun because when we, if you go back to when we landed back from Charlotte at Drake Field and to see, you know, several thousand fans out there greeting us, you know, that's when you finally recognize you know, how important that it was, but at the same time, recognize the type of fan base uh, that you actually had. I mean, granted, you know that when you playing in front of 20,000 every night, but when they show up without a game to just celebrate with you and to cherish that moment, you know, that was huge. You know, transitioning, you know, coming back, being a college student athlete, it was almost like living a dream in one sense, but on the other side, it was like going to work every day because every game that we had, it was everyone's championship game. And so it got to the point to where it was still fun, but it just felt a little different. It just felt like it was more of a job uh, because you were getting everyone's best shot. And you often hear people say, you know, you're going to get everyone's best shot, but you don't know what that means until you actually live it. And so, you know, it was it was a tough basketball season. You know, we were very fortunate to get back to the Final Four, uh, but just each and every day was kind of like living a dream and kind of like almost being a superstar because everywhere you went, people recognized you, wanted to have a piece of you, wanted to talk to you, wanted you to sign something. And so, you know, those are days that, you know, you often cherish, you know, but during that time, it was kind of a, a tough balance of being, you know, celebrated on one hand, but then also having a battle each and every night. What transpired at the end of your junior year to make you want to forego? And back then, that was, that was, kind of unusual, right? Like like to leave early at all, right. all the way back in, in, in the mid nineties. What made you decide to, to put yourself in the draft and forego your senior year? Well, believe it or not, it was actually a combination of reasons. Um, <clears throat> I was still in school at that time. You know, I was still taking classes. Even after Corliss had had his press conference, you know, I was still going to class. I was still maintaining my coursework. And so I really didn't have any intention of actually leaving. Um, and then I got a phone call from Coach Richardson. He wanted to talk. You know, we sat down and visited, and we talked to several teams, uh, New Jersey Nets, Sacramento Kings, Isaiah Thomas, because at that time, uh, Isaiah Thomas was working with the Raptors, and they were actually trying to kind of convince Coach Richardson to leave Arkansas for the Raptors job, if you remember that. And so wow. there was a lot of hoopla about, you know, where I would be picked and that type of thing, and everyone we talked I don't to, think a lot of people – know much about that. No, a lot of people probably don't. And, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of things that transpired that people maybe forget or maybe not have been, you know, privy to. And so, you know, when I went down and sat down and talked to Coach, you know, we had a conversation. You know, everyone was stating that, everyone that we talked to stated that, you know, if I were to come out, I'd be a first-round pick. 
you know, I go back, I have a conversation with my mother who was actually in town at the time because we were getting ready to go on summer break. And so I was going home. And so she was there to help me kind of load my things up, her and my father to get back to Louisiana for a little bit. And so we had a conversation and we were like, hey, you know, if you're a first round pick, you know, what are you thinking? And so at that time, you know, my thoughts were like, okay, if I'm a first round pick, then I guess, you know, it is time to go. And so I made the decision to leave. One of the factors was I had a young son at the time. And, you know, obviously we didn't have NIL and we didn't have ways of really being compensated, you know, legal ways to be compensated, I should say. And so, uh, you know, it was kind of like between a rock and a hard place here. I am a 19 year old about to be a father and, you know, I've got to be able to provide for him. And so I knew that was one of the ways that I could actually do so. And so I pursued it. Little did I know, you know, that there's a lot of background work that goes into selecting an agent, you know, who the agent has relationships with and, you know, kind of the system of the NBA in terms of someone working behind the scenes to either have you picked earlier, you know, or picked later, or in my case, you know, not being picked. Uh, Fortunate for me, you know, when you when you go through that, I was still able to have the opportunity to play after that. And so I was fortunate enough to still go and play in Europe. And I had opportunities to come back and try out for other teams, but it had got to the point where I was making a decent living, you know, for my family and I was being gone home for six months here, five months there, four months there. So whenever I did get a chance to come home, I just didn't see the need to try to chase something when I already had something. And so for me, it was kind of hard for me after I, after you become 25 and you're really a five year vet, it's kind of like, do I really want to go to LA Summer League and battle a 19, 20 year old when I've already got a contract in my face? And so I just kind of made the decision to stay on that side of the world and continue to play. And obviously some people would probably say, you know, why would he do that? But for me, it was, you know, a place of feeling like, you know, you were wanted. And then it was also a place of feeling like, you know, I can make a decent living doing this and you still get an opportunity to play and travel and see the world. And so fortunate for me, man, I've been all over the world playing this game. And so that's not something that I don't think I'd be willing to trade. Let me go back to Coach Richardson for a second. Did, did you think maybe he was going to leave at that time? I mean, was that part of the discussion or? It wasn't really part of the discussion. I mean, I really didn't have any, you know, worries about him leaving per se. You know, my biggest thing was, you know, coming back, playing on a new team, uh, being at the top of the food chain as far as the scout report's concerned and not knowing, you know, who I'm really going to be playing with. Obviously, they had good players with Kareem Reed and Pat Beverly and Sun Adebayo. So there was some talent coming in. But, you know, when you have two back-to-back Final Fours, you're wondering what's going to top that and, you know, are you going to be able to get back to that? Like, I don't think that a Sweet 16 or an NCAA tournament appearance would have been the same as – what I had just experienced those two years. And so for me, it was kind of like, do you want to go back through this again with a completely different group of guys? Um, you know, I would have basically been the elder statesman in the locker room, which I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm just not so sure at that point in my career, that's what I wanted for myself. You know, I don't know if you've seen this, but I, I was doing just some brush up research on you. Obviously I know your story well, but there's something on YouTube. I think the, the account is like stunted growth. And this guy goes and finds stories of like something that doesn't make sense. Right. And and he goes through this whole thing about you and how it makes no sense that you were that good and, and didn't get to get play a game in the NBA. And he goes through scenarios. One of them is if you would have left after your freshman year, your NBA prospects might have been different based on when you came out and how the NBA right. drafts on potential and seeing that. Right. Uh, not not to go, you know, relive it all and could you have done something different, right. but but have, have you thought about that over the years since that? Because I think it was a real shock to a lot of people that that you didn't get a better look, it, it, no more so than you, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, during that time, you know, when it, when it didn't happen the way that, you know, you had kind of expected it to, I mean, I was devastated at that time, you know, being 20 years old, you know, you got all these things being said and written about you in a positive light. And then all of a sudden you're the poster boy for, you know, what shouldn't have happened or, or what, what's gone wrong with college basketball. And so really to be 20, you know, that was, a, that was tough for me to deal with, to be honest. You know, I struggled with, you know, a lot of things at that time, but fortunately for me, and I think the thing that people lose sight of is that I was always a good student. You know, I was always pretty smart. I could always read and comprehend. I always knew how to do other things besides play basketball. And so 
when it didn't happen. And, you know, once you're 21 and you get through the lulls of something not transpiring the way that, you know, you wanted it to, you feel a little bit better knowing that you still got other outlets and you still got other things that you're able to do. And so, you know, it was tough you know, that, that year. But after I kind of, you know, got past the point of what didn't happen, I just got back in the gym and just continued to work. And I had opportunities to go and work out with the Sacramento Kings. I declined it. I had opportunities to go and work out with the New Jersey Nets. I declined it because I really didn't trust, you know, NBA GMs and personnel. You know, I kind of lost trust in believing what they say and understanding that, you know, everybody's kind of got their own method to how they select players or sign players to contracts. And, you know, I never forget when I signed as a free agent to go work out for New Jersey that year. Um, you know, I didn't get drafted, so I come in as an undrafted free agent. I had a, what they called back then was a make good contract. And so I was told by, I won't mention names, but I was told by several higher ups and my representation was told this as well was, you know, if you come into our camp and you shoot 45% from three, we're going to figure out a way to keep you. Well, I shot 51 and I still got released. And so at that point, it's just kind of like, well, do they really want to pick me? Now, going back to the draft, a story that probably not many people know, if any, you know, I get a call from the Houston Rockets on draft night. Well, actually draft day. And the conversation was, hey, you know, if we pick you, would you be available for comment? Well, at that time, I'm thinking, you guys have just won the world championship. You got the last pick in the draft. I'm not planning on being around for the last pick in the draft. Now at 49 and maybe even at 29, looking back on it, my response probably should have been different than what it was. It was, yeah, I guess I'll be available. But I didn't think that I was gonna be available, right? And so looking back on it, if I say, of course I'll be available, then maybe they pick me and then I get an opportunity to play with Kenny Smith and Elijah Wan and that group who went back that following year to the finals. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that you can look back on that you could always say you could have done differently. But, you know, the thing I try to tell people, if, if you don't see me frustrated and irritated about something that didn't happen for me, then I don't, I don't want you to be frustrated because basketball has given me a hell of a life. And, you know, I don't have anything to be upset or complain about. You know, I've got two grandkids. I'm gonna date myself a little bit. I got two grand boys eight and four, you know, I got a 29 year old son and an 18 year old daughter. I don't have, I got a beautiful wife, you know, so I don't have anything to complain about. No, nobody owes Scotty Thurman anything. How'd you get through that time though? I, I think there's a, I marvel at the kind of person you are, what you've become, what you've done with your life since that time. Uh, it's not an easy thing to, to deal with something devastatingly disappointing. Right. Well, I, it was a lot of different things, a lot of different people that helped me. You know, I've got a lot of close friends, you know, Corliss being one of them, uh, you know, my former teammates, you know, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, uh, my kids, obviously, and my parents who are both deceased now, you know, were very involved in my life, my siblings as well. And so, you know, really getting through it, it was a lot of prayer, obviously, and it was a lot of you know, just spending time with family because one thing I've always tried to share with people who don't know me is that most of my friends, they don't play sports. Most of my friends are just regular people. They just go to work or they go to school or they do whatever it is, you know, that's in their wheelhouse. And so I've always surrounded myself with people that were different than me. You know, I've never wanted to be just an athlete. And so when I didn't get picked, my mind was, hey, okay, they don't think I'm a good enough player, but they've forgotten that I can do a lot of other stuff. And so during that time, I was able to obtain a real estate license. It's inactive now, but I have a real estate license. I have a construction license. And so there's a lot of things that I've been able to do that I don't know if I would have even pursued those things had I actually been picked, you know? And so I don't really look at it as something that is a negative. I looked at it as something that was a negative that turned into a positive. And I'm a positive person, you know, people even tell you, I don't, I don't even like negativity around me. I don't like people around me that speak down on others. I don't like people around me that don't have a positive outlook on life because life's too short for that. And so, you know, after that one year of, you know, kind of going through what I would call a semi-depression 
and it didn't kill me. And like they say, you know, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. And that's what I feel like it did for me. Tell me a little bit about your professional career uh, in Europe. In Europe. Just a summary. Oh, man. Overseas. Got an opportunity to play. I mean, I've traveled to probably more countries than I have cities in the United States. I mean, you know, I've been fortunate enough to go to played in Greece, but while in Greece was able to go and visit, you know, other countries. You know, been fortunate enough to go to Russia, Poland, um, I mean, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Italy, France. I mean, the list goes on and on. I've been to Dubai so many times that now people are talking about it like it's popular. I was going to Dubai in 2001. And so I've been, my son got the chance to go to Dubai when he was in the seventh grade, you know, and now I see people talking about Dubai like it's something new. And so for me, man, th that's the part of basketball a lot of people don't get a chance to see. Now, there are some horror stories for a lot of people because they go over there and, you know, it could be a situation where you don't receive your money and that type of thing. And fortunately for me, I didn't have to experience that. And so I was able to, you know, save up my money, but I also was able to utilize my time over there to focus on what I would do once I got back here and my playing career was over. And so, you know, got an opportunity to travel. My family got an opportunity to come over there and see quite a bit. My best friend from childhood came over to Greece and hung out with me for about five, six weeks, took a leave of absence from work just to come spend time with me. And so, you know, he's another person that was very influential during that time. And so I just went back to my roots, man, and just started once again, spending time with the people that, you know, meant the most to me, aside from my teammates and coaches that I had in Arkansas, but just people who had been with me from, Scotty Thurman, the kid, the young man, not Scotty Thurman, just the Razorback. Give me a couple highlights from your professional career that maybe some don't know about. A couple highlights, man. I once scored 54 in a game and lost. And that was <laughs> that was like the worst feeling oh, ever. And I, yeah. But that was the hottest that I'd ever been in a game in terms of shooting the basketball. Um, one of the other highlights was having the opportunity to go and play uh, in Singapore. There was a uh, cup that was played their Asian championships that we played there. My team made it to the finals of that. And that's when I first realized that ESPN had ESPN Singapore and ESPN this and ESPN that. And so I got the opportunity to kind of learn that, you know, there's different forms of news on that side of the world. And sometimes the story that's being portrayed on this side or that side could be a little bit different. What an experience. And you got back and, and decided you're going to hang it up, right? What, what, after 11 years, you come back to Arkansas. Get, walk me through what happens deciding to to hang up the, the professional career and move into something else. Well, man, it's funny. I really, when I gave it up, I didn't really have any plans on giving it up. Um, but I came home on a break, and my son at the time was eighth grade. And so, you know, I went over to his school to kind of, you know, check him out for lunch and went and ate with him. And you know, go talk with him. And so every time I would come home, you know, that was my focus was trying to spend as much time with him as possible. And the one thing I realized, you know, that you didn't get time back. You know, here I am, I'm overseas, I'm making pretty good money, I'm able to provide for him, but I'm still not there. And so, you know, I kind of made a promise to him that, you know, I wasn't going to go back because I wanted to be able to spend more time with him. I wanted to make sure that I could be involved in his life, not just from a financial standpoint, but from actual time. And so, you know, I wound up volunteering at his school and I helped out that it was like the summer, going into the summer, spring, summer, because I would always get home in like March, April. And so I went and volunteered at his school and I helped with the off season. And then that just kind of led me into um, doing AAU. And while I was doing AAU, you know, I didn't have a quote unquote high school coaching job. I was doing what a lot of people have no idea that I've been involved in since 01, which is flipping houses. And so I was buying houses and flipping them up and that was giving me the opportunity to spend as much time with him as I wanted because I could kind of set my own schedule. And so I started flipping houses and once I got used to flipping houses and learned about, you know, the do's and don'ts of it, that was kind of my thing, you know, I, and then I started building. And then I started doing more rehabs and then I started acquiring rental. And so the rest was just kind of history. I just got to the point to where I liked what I was doing, but I think I liked more about being able to provide, but also being able to take him to school every day, pick him up, you know, go to his practices and try to make up for some of that lost time. And 
once I started enjoying that, man, it was kind of hard for me to leave him again. Scotty Jr. ended up being a Razorback too, but, right. but playing football. Right. How do we how do we veer off the basketball course there? Well, I never really expected <laughs> him to be a basketball player. I mean, he did play all the way up into his tenth grade year. Played played one year at Fayetteville High School for the JV. Played two years at Episcopal uh, Collegiate School here in Little Rock. But he really never loved basketball. I think he just played it because, you know, dad played and he played because I think other people expected him to play. But then I was coaching a team and there was always, you know, seven, eight guys at the house spending the night, you know, how AAU can be. And so it kind of gave him a little bit of a infrastructure to have built in friends that he didn't necessarily go to school with, but relationships that he could develop over time. And so he kind of cultivated those relationships, and then he came to me after his junior year of high school and said, Dad, I just want to focus on football. And I'm like, okay. And so, you know, he starts playing football, and coming out of high school in Fayetteville, he had an opportunity to play for two state championships. I think they won both. Uh, he also had a chance to win a track uh, championship. And so they've got more high school rings. I never won a state championship in high school, so he won one. My daughter actually won one. but. You know, the football thing for him, I think, was just something he gravitated to because his body type, you know, he's 5'9", kind of fast, a little stocky. And so Arkansas invited him to walk on, you know, after his senior year of high school. And so it wound up being a great fit for him. And obviously I was there, you know, working at the U of A, so it just kind of worked out. The other thing I notice about you, if you go look at some of the things that, that Scotty Thurman has done since his basketball career, is you you love it seems you love to teach and, and influence people. Right. You know, whether you're, you know, uh, at Arkansas and, and student development uh, at Episcopal, same kind of thing, uh, community relations, right. coaching, teaching. Uh, what is it about that that you've enjoyed? Well, I mean, I just really – and I was so blessed growing up, you know, I had a mother that was a social worker. And so, you know, I've always gone into broken homes and saw people, you know, have too much pride to receive, whether it be utility assistance, whether it be, you know, meals, free meals and vouchers, um, any type of aid that could be offered. You know, my mother used to be a big proponent of making sure that, you know, underprivileged and underserved families receive that. You know, I've been on the back of the truck dropping off meals for, you know, Meals on Wheels program. You know, I've been a part of refurbishing houses and painting, you know, as part of the workforce that, workforce development group when I was probably underage, probably shouldn't even been able to help, but, you know, they allowed me to volunteer. So my whole life, I've kind of saw my mother do that. You know, I have aunts that also were involved in those type of uh, services. And so when I got to the point where I was in a position to be able to help other people, I just kind of just took it on, you know? And so for me, like even with basketball, of course I want to win every game and, you know, I coach my hardest and try to practice and all of those things. But for me, the biggest win for me is watching a young man, you know, do well on a test or conquer a subject that he was maybe afraid of and struggle with, or go and get some help for a mental illness and be able to overcome whatever that is. And so I've seen myself and a lot of kids that I've worked with and a lot of young people and so I've just tried to give back what's been given to me. You know, I had a lot of good coaches when I was in middle school, even back before that, when I played in church league, when I was five, six years old. A lady by the name of Glenda Smith would come and pick me up every day and take me to practice. You know, I've had AAU coaches who I played out of South Louisiana, about three hours away from where I grew up. But I had guys that would come and pick me up every weekend, take me to practice and bring me home. And so, all the people that have helped me, man, I just really feel like I'm just doing what was done for me and just kind of passing the torch on, so to speak. I just have a little bit of a different insight because I was fortunate enough to play college basketball and to be exposed to a lot. But at the end of the day, you know, we're all just people. And so I, I never really lose sight of that. You started back at Arkansas on, on the basketball staff in a support role. You did radio analysis for a while with, with the voice of the Razorbacks. Chuck Barrett eventually became an assistant on the basketball team under John Pelfrey and then Mike Anderson. How did you get to that point? That Was that something that you had intended or an opportunity that just presented itself and kind of grew? Well, the first opportunity, the director of student development, it kind of just turned into something like, you know, at the time 
you know, Coach John Perfect was the was the head coach. And so during that year, you know, he had a friend of mine um, that worked as an assistant. And so he was kind of, I don't know if he was forced to resign or not, but, you know, he was asked to resign. And so he wound up stepping away. And so he stepped away. And so, you know, obviously here in Arkansas, everything hits the paper. So I see the article in the paper and I'm like, what's going on? And so I reached out to a friend of mine who worked in the athletic department and just asked, you know, what was going on and were they going to replace anyone in that position? And to be quite honest, I didn't even realize I was even a candidate, to be honest. I just wanted to know what was going on with it and I had interest. And so um, that person told me, hey, send me your resume and I'll walk it over there to Coach Pelfrey. And I'm like, really? And so I sent it. And they took it to Coach Pelfrey and Coach Pelfrey. <laughs> Did you, just, you should have said, just look at the wall over there, but <laughs> that's, that's my resume. Right. Well, Coach Pelfrey called me like within minutes. And he was like, you know, what's up, Scotty? You know, are you really interested in this position? And this is what it entails and da 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 da. And so long story short, you know, we talked a few times. I came up and met with him a few times and had a couple of conversations with Jeff Long, who was a, who was the AD at the time, and so really there was an issue with APR, which a lot of people aren't familiar with. And so at the time, Razorbacks were struggling basketball-wise in terms of graduating players, um, in terms of making sure that guys were participating in things that were important to the AD, like community service. Um, they would have a lot of uh, leadership meetings, you know, whether that be Razorback leadership or whether that be job fairs, internships, and really the participation level was low. And so we weren't graduating players and the numbers in terms of performance-based stuff that Jeff Long considered to be important, which they are important, you know, our kids weren't participating. And so for me, when I got the job to come in and that was one of my key things, you know, I just kind of took the bull by the horns. i never forget when I first came in, you know, we didn't have guys doing summer jobs. That was Ricky Scott, Madrakus Wade, Marvell Wade, Marshawn Powell, Julissus Nobles, and that group. And so I went in and I asked Coach Perry, I'm like, hey, do you mind if I help these guys get summer jobs? And he was like, no, that's fine, but they're not going to work. I'm just going to tell you. And I was like, well, let me get past that. I just want to make sure, you know, you're okay with it. He was like, oh, I'm fine as long as it doesn't affect workouts. Hey, I want these guys to make some money. And so within a week, Ricky Scott, Madrakus Wade, Marvell Wade, they all had jobs. Well, what do kids do? They talk. So the next thing I know, I'm standing at my door and all of a sudden everybody's in line like, hey coach, can you help me get a job? And so before I knew it, I no longer had to run to them. You know, they were coming to me. And once they started coming to me, it was easy for me to say, hey, we need to do this because this is gonna help you you know, magnify your profile. It's gonna put you in a situation where you'll be marketable once you're done. And so if you're doing community service because you don't have time to work, hey, do the service. If you're doing internships and that's gonna occupy your time and give you the experience you need, hey, let's do that. And so I worked really well with Eric Wood at the time, who was our director of student athlete development for the school side or for the athletic department side, I should say. And so we just kind of worked hand in hand and make sure our guys were participating and fortunately for me, it's just kind of the work ethic of that, I think, showed people that I was committed. You know, everybody wants to coach college. You know, you got junior high guys that think they want to coach college, but a lot of them want to come straight from being a junior high coach or a high school coach and go right into the assistant role. And I knew that that's just not how that happened. And so for me, I just put in six years, not ever really expecting to be promoted to an assistant. I just wanted to do the best I could in the role that I was in. And so I just worked hard at it. And, you know, lo and behold, Coach Pelfrey gets let go. Coach Anderson comes in and decides to keep me in that position. And at the time I knew, you know, he had his assistant. So I knew there was no opportunity for me to really move up as an assistant. So I started teaching. I started doing the radio, just trying to expand, you know, the things that I could do or that I felt like I was good at. And for, for me, that work ethic, I think, is what, you know, put me in a position for him to name me assistant coach. So you enjoyed your time once you were an assistant? Did you did you start thinking maybe this coaching thing is something I could really dig in on? Well, I really enjoyed it, man. I mean, I, I really did. I mean, I got a chance to coach in the NCAA tournament twice. You know, I got a chance to coach in NIT once. And so for me, you know, that that's when I started reliving kind of the memories of me as a player when you're actually in March Madness, but you're in a different role. 
and you're trying to, you know, help these guys figure out, you know, different schemes or different things that we can do to be a better team. You know, that was huge for me. And to be quite frankly, I mean, I never had any intention of not remaining there, to be quite frankly. But, you know, I understand sometimes when there's a change, you know, different different people want different things on their staff. What was next after Arkansas for you? What'd you do at that point? Well, when I left, you know, I was still on the contract for about 90 days. And to be quite frankly, I didn't do very much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I spent, I spent quite a bit of time with yeah. my wife and daughter. I spent quite a bit of time with my son. You know, we traveled a little bit. You know, I went to the NBA Summer League and did some things that I didn't get, I didn't really have the opportunity to do while I was working, you know, for the U of A. And so I kind of just took a break, man, took a step back. And I was in New York at the time. My wife was taking a uh, continuing education course there. And my daughter and I, we were just kind of going around town, looking at shoes and looking at different houses, you know, driving by Yankee Stadium, just doing something different that we didn't have the opportunity to do while I was coaching. And, you know, I got a call from a buddy of mine about, you know, this position. And so we started talking about it. And, you know, I had an opportunity to talk to Coach Flanagan about it. And, you know, the rest was just kind of history, just moved kind of fast from there. And I wound up, you know, accepting this, this role. Head coach at Parkview? Yes. In Little Rock? Yep. Head basketball coach, Scotty Thurman. Uh, what's that been like for you? I mean, you seem you seem comfortable at peace. Uh, I'm looking at you right now in, <laughs> in the office. I mean, it looks like you like it. Man, I do like it, man. I mean, it keeps me feeling young, you know, get a chance to interact with, you know, 13, 14, all the way up to 17, 18, you know, every day. You know, it keeps you young, it keeps the adrenaline going. I mean, like I said earlier, it's challenges, you know, like it is in everything. You know, it has its ups and downs. There's some days I'm irritated and frustrated, but most days, you know, I'm pretty excited to come here because I feel like I've tried to make a difference. And, you know, obviously I hadn't had opportunity to, you know, win a state championship just yet, which that's the expectation here. You know, I've had the opportunity to make it to two semis and just couldn't quite get over the hump to get to that finals game. And so, you know, that's what drives me. But but more important than that, man, you know, I, I see a lot of young men in this community that could be doing anything else besides coming to school every day. and trying to play sports and trying to be in something positive. And so I don't really take that lightly. You know, I feel like I can be the vessel for some of them to have other opportunities, even if it's not playing college ball, to just be in a position to be successful. And I mean, most of that starts, you know, right now in high school at their age now. What do you hope to do um, in your your career as a high school coach besides win a state championship? What, what kind of impact do you, do you hope to have? Man, it's so funny you mentioned that. Um, you know, my, my biggest goal in all of this is just for my kids to know that I care about them. You know, obviously I want to win every game, but me losing the game is not going to change my attitude toward a kid, especially when I know that they put their best foot forward. You know, we all fall short in certain things, but, you know, I just want all of my kids to know that if, if something were to happen and, you know, their parents or their caregiver or whoever was not available to be able to assist them, then they can count on me. Doesn't matter if it's two in the morning, three in the morning, four in the morning. I'm gonna get out of my bed and go do what I can to try to make the situation right. And so that's really all I want. As far as for me personally, man, basketball doesn't owe me a thing. There's no individuals that owe me a thing. I don't really have any complaint about the life that I'm fortunate enough to get the opportunity to live. And so, you know, like I said, basketball has been great for me. You know, my wife is doing very well in her profession. So I've got a lot of support between, you know, her profession, but also just her being there by my side. And so, you know, we laugh all the time, you know, for people at our age to be in the position that we are in. We're very thankful for it and we don't really take it for granted. You start with a dream as a kid. Part of it's hitting a, a championship shot. You hit that. The, the other part of it's probably going on to the NBA and having a career. And, you know, you just you, you have it drawn up, right? Right. Uh, it's it's fascinating to, to listen to your story and hear how it didn't go exactly like maybe you thought, right. especially after hitting that shot right. and entering the draft early. But you said it earlier. I mean, you're you're content with with the life and the career that you've had. Right. And I would go beyond that and say, man, you've had an amazing impact in a way that would be completely different than somebody would have scripted. Right. Well, uh, how do you when you take a step back, what's your reaction to that? I mean, I'm always amazed that, you know, the one thing about, you know, my career as far as the way other people see it, 
I'm always amazed at, you know, how people approach me and come up to me and want to shake my hand and want me to sign things. Like, that's always been humbling to me. It's never been a situation where, oh, man, I don't want to sign that or, oh, I wish they get away from me. Because I know there's a lot of other people that wish they could be in that position. And so, you know, having said that, there's a lot of doors that have opened for me and there's a lot of doors that I've been able to open for other people uh, on just having relationships. And so for me, I feel like everything went the way that the good man upstairs wanted to happen. It didn't necessarily go my way. It didn't necessarily go some of my supporters way. And I understand that. But, you know, the one thing that I learned from my grandmother and my grandfather, who was a pastor, you know, they say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And so I stopped making plans a long time ago. I just try to make preparation. Well, as you approach 50 years old this year, let's go ahead and get that out there. <laughs> the big 5-0. I mean, you know, when we're talking about a 30-year shot, you got to be right. somewhere in that right. range. But as you as you reflect now, and, and it's been great to hear your perspective and your story today, but how do you hope Razorback fans remember Scotty Thurman today and 30 years from now? Oh, man. I just hope that they, you know, can continue to appreciate, you know, what I tried to bring, you know, to the program. I hope they appreciate the fact that, you know, no matter what I'm doing, whether I'm coaching at Parkview or whether I'm not coaching, I'm, I'm a Razorback through and through. Um, that's one of the reasons why I haven't pursued other college positions because I don't really have the uh, mindset to really help another school. And so that's probably cost me some opportunities, but there's only one college that I'm really concerned about, and that's the University of Arkansas. And so whatever I could do, whether that be coaching or anything that could do to help the program, I'm still on board with that. Doesn't matter if Coach Muscle is the coach or Nolan Richards is the coach or Mike Anderson, at the end of the day, I'm still a Razorback. And so even when my daughter chose to go to North Carolina, you know, I told people, hey, I'm going to support her, but this would be the only time that I would ever have on North Carolina colors. And so no disrespect to North Carolina, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm a Razorback. I didn't leave Louisiana uh, to be, I, didn't, I wasn't an LSU Tiger. And so I came to Arkansas to be a Razorback, and that's the way I want to be remembered.